and I get a thumbs up. We all can see the recording. We see the screen. It's all right. Cool. Okay, so we've gone, we're just going through the balance sheet, right? We've gone through like fundamentals of accounting, debits, credits. Debits always equal credits. What's a normal balance? How the financial statements flow. We've gone through uh, some systems, how we close accounts, how we close our journal entries. And then we've gone over how to do individual journal entries. And we started going through the financial statements. We went through cash considerations last time. We've gone through inventory. And now we're going to go to accounts receivable. And then as we go through the rest of the class, we'll go over all other major accounts. And then we'll end the class with some statement of cash flows um, and equity considerations. So accounts receivable is the next piece of liquidity after cash, right? So we have cash. Cash is cash or things that we can convert to cash quickly, cash equivalents. And then we have accounts receivable. What's accounts receivable? Accounts receivable is just what we're owed. If we've sold something and we are now owed money for it, it's an accounts receivable. A few different examples, real life examples. If I sell $1,000 of shoes to another company, I can send them an invoice that says they owe me that in 30 days, the payment for the shoes in 30 days. And we went over invoices of, for payment, right? Already we went over the discounting. If, if they haven't paid me yet, it's an accounts receivable for myself. I debit accounts receivable, I credit sales. Same thing, uh, same thing if I'm performing consulting services. If I perform consulting services, it's a, uh, a let's say I perform a month worth of consulting services for $20,000. And I charge, I send an invoice to my uh, customer saying they owe me the full payment in 30 days. On the day of the invoicing, I'd have an accounts receivable, debit accounts receivable, 20,000, because accounts receivable is an asset. And then I'd credit my sales, 20,000. Why do we have an accounts receivable? Because of accrual-based accounting and gap-based accounting, right? We have to recognize revenue when it's earned, even when we haven't collected cash yet. And so since I've earned the revenue at that time, I'd have to debit the accounts receivable and credit uh, my revenue. And then the next entry is, uh, always happens or almost always happens is we collect the cash, right? 30 days later, I should be able to collect the cash where I debit my cash. Cash is an asset. So as a debit, normal balance, debit it, and then credit my accounts receivable. I no longer have an accounts receivable. I receive my cash, but there's some considerations around this that we're going to talk about. Like if, if I bill somebody, what's the big risk here? Well, sometimes people don't pay their bills, right? Sometimes companies don't pay their bills. And so when we value accounts receivable, there's a risk uh, that we might not have some collections and that's called a bad debt. I, we have a bad debt reserve and expense for our accounts receivable. And so we'll go, we'll go over all of this today. So how do we value an accounts receivable? And so a receivable is the amount due from another party. And this graph shows the amount of dollars for receivables and their percent of assets for well-known companies. And so these are the percentage of assets that are accounts receivables. So Pfizer, Pfizer's a big one right now. You'd say 5% of Pfizer's receive assets are receivables. Like that's a large portion of their assets, right? Callaway Golf is 18%. Uh, like, these are huge percentages. And I'm sure if you look at most balance sheets, you have huge amounts ranging from one to 10% of accounts receivable on the balance sheet. That means a company that's a billion dollars might have a hundred million dollars of receivables. So this is a really high impact item. And that complexity of here is you could be an accounts receivable specialist. Like this is a whole job I've seen at almost every company I've consulted for is you'll have a receivable specialist who tracks every single customer and how much money they owe and when they're expected to pay it and how behind they are on their bills. And then you might even, that accountant might be in charge of all of debt collections. So uh, it's important here to know too, accounts receivable is different than a note receivable. If I lend money to somebody or if a company lends money to somebody or a customer without selling something, it's a notes receivable. It's a loan. Accounts receivable is always tied to a sale. So they're separate. They're different classifications. So very traditionally, we sell things on credit. Why do we sell on credit? To be competitive. And because that's what our customers want. For me, this is, this is a real business, right? I consult and my clients pay me generally. I, I either ask for prepaid for my small clients, but for my big clients that pay me tens of thousands of dollars, 
I will give them 30 days to pay me. So I'll send them a bill after I, <clears throat> so it takes me a while to get paid, right? I might do work for a month, bill them $10,000, and then they have 30 days to pay me. So theoretically, I did work 60 days before I get paid. The reason that I do that is because it's good for my customers, right? That helps me win bigger customers. Bigger customers aren't willing to prepay me for my work generally. Smaller customers, I can convince them to prepay me for my work. That's just a best practice. So that's a credit on sales. That almost always happens. Don't get this confused with sales on credit cards. Credit cards are different and almost considered cash equivalents many times. This is me literally telling the customer, you owe me money, but you don't have to pay me for 30 days. So this is a good example of Techcom has a credit sale for $950 and a collection of $720 from RDA Electronics. Oh, so sorry, cash, comp, so two different customers, Comp Store and RDA Electronics. So we'd have a debit accounts receivable for a specific customer, the Comp Store of 950, and then we'd recognize our sales revenue of 950. And then we'd debit cash of 720 for the collection. And then we have a specific customer, RDA Electronics accounts receivable at 720. On the financial statements, you're just gonna get one line item, accounts receivable, but on a tracking tracking for tracking purposes, we're going to have individual line items for every customer, right? Because we have to know who owes us money. So we can go to them and ask for them for it when they're late. And so this is showing how it all kind of plays out. We have our general ledger, which would show our full accounts receivable balance. And then we'd have a schedule of accounts receivables that would say, here's our customers and how much money they owe us. And then we can go into the ledger and look at every single customer, how they've paid. And so we can see different levels of aggregation of detail. So we can aggregate it to the highest level and say, hey, we're owed $3 million. Or we could ask individual customers, how, when did they pay us? How much did they owe us? We wanna track all of this information, it's all relevant. So sales on a store's credit card, uh, record a sales on their own credit card in the amount of $1,000. Record an adjusting entry for the interest earned uh, of 1.5% per month on a seller credit card. And so don't confuse this with your credit card. It's a seller credit card. So this is, if Target gives you a Target credit card. You know, every time you go into these stores now, they always ask you to sign up for their own cards, right? I mean, I don't know the last time any of us went into a store, but if you have gone into one recently, I'm sure they're still asking you to sign up for a card, like a Macy's card or a Target card or a Best Buy card. When they give you that, that's them pretty much giving you an accounts receivable. They're saying, hey, use our money, just make sure you pay us back. If you use your own credit card, it's not considered an accounts receivable. So always remember, like, it's, it's easy to get comp confused, but remember you were looking at from the side of the business. So if you pay the business with your credit card, that's a different situation than the business giving them their own, giving you their own credit card. So think of this as like Best Buy giving you a Best Buy credit card. So recorded sales using, a, their customers use the Best Buy credit cards of $1,000. And then we earn interest as well. We have to make sure that that interest is separate. So there's an interest rate on the credit card, 1.5% per month. So we're a uh, pretty high interest rate. And we're saying on the, when we do the sale, it's $1,000. Debit $1,000 to accounts receivable because accounts receivable is an asset. Assets have a debit normal balance and credit sales by 1,000 because sales are on the income statement uh, and they affect equity, credit's a normal balance. So accounts receivable then also is increased for the interest revenue as an accrual, right? We do an accrual for the interest revenue. We haven't received cash yet. Both of these are accrual based entries for gap accounting. So I have a question on the second entry. Yep. Um, so this accounts receivable for the December 31st, that's gonna go on the balance sheet and the interest revenue is gonna go below the line, like below the net income where we have the other uh, income? Yeah, it's not gonna be below net income. It'll be below, it, it'll, it'll be a separate line though. It's, gonna not be, it's not gonna be part of their, um, their gross margin. You're right, okay. it's gonna be separate, yeah. Great question. Good, good, good identification. And that's how we should all be thinking, right? There's all these puzzle pieces. That was really good, Mujaba. That, that 
we always want to be looking at the puzzle pieces and seeing the full picture. All right, we have the journal entries, we have the financial statements, we have the actual transaction, and we should be putting it all together. Like, oh, well, when we do a journal entry, where is it going to be on the financial statement? If it's on the financial statement, how did what was the actual underlying transaction that occurred? So great job. So if we did sale on a bank credit card, this is the opposite, right? So if you paid with a bank credit card, we can custom companies consider that cash. But then the bank credit cards, so like I have my Visa, like my Visa credit card that I use, that my Amazon credit card. And if I use that at Best Buy for a hundred dollar purchase, they the reason Visa gives you credit cards is because they collect money, not only interest from you, but they collect money from the customer as well. Every time you swipe a credit card, there's like a 4% transaction fee. And so, and it depends on the business and their negotiations. But if I use my credit card at Best Buy for $100, that's not a Best Buy credit card, then they would recognize this entry. They debit cash $96, debit credit card expense $4, and their sales would be $100. So that's the difference. You have to know, is it a bank credit card or is it the business's credit card, right? So make sure you have that, that differentiation in your mind. And then there can be a sales on installment. So what's a good example here? You might, uh, you know those rent to buy places. Like you get a couch, you get to pay $100 a month for the next, 20 years to get your couch or whatever it might be. That's kind of rent installment payments. You're paying a certain amount every single month to buy and buy an object or an asset. So we can go through these questions really quick. So I'll just go to the answers because I need to save a little time for us to go over the midterm. So let's read the question first. What are we doing? We're preparing journal entries to record a selected credit card transaction for the retailer. We sold $1,000 on the customer's bank card. It's a bank card, right? So because it's a bank card, we're not, we're not recognizing an accounts receivable. We're recognizing cash. If it was our card, we'd recognize accounts receivable. So this is a bank card. We'd have to pay our transaction fee. The transaction fee is 5%. So 5% times 1,000 is our 50. And then our cash would be 950, the difference, and we'd recognize a sale of 1,000. Then we'd have to recognize, we did our inventory journal entries before, right? On January 2nd, then we do our cost of sales and our merchandise inventory at the same time. This is the cost of 600. So we debit cost of sales, credit my merchandise inventory, and to Majaba's point, then we'd recognize revenue as follows. We'd have the sales of 1,000, less the cost of goods sold. So our gross profit would be 400. And then the 400 minus the 50 of credit card expenses or miscellaneous expenses would then be our next or net income on a multi-step uh, multi financial statement or income statement. So the next piece, uh, recognize sold merchandise of 400 that had cost 300 on the customer's visa card. So it's the next one, 400. The 400 times a 3%, it's a 3% fee here. That's $12. So we only able to collect $388 cash. That's the 400 minus the 12. We recognize the same journal entry, debit cash, debit the expense because the expenses have a normal balance of a debit, credit the sales. Then we'd recognize the cost of sales here reduce our inventory, and, uh, and then our, we'd do the same kind of calculation for our, um, for our determination of net income. Net income would be the 400, our gross profit would be 400 minus 300, that'd be 100 gross profit minus the 12, which then we have our 88 would be our net income. But then we also have interest revenue here. We recognize 75 interest of interest revenue for store credit, separate store credit. Because it's store credit, it goes to our accounts receivable. And so we'd increase our accounts receivable and uh, credit our interest revenue.